Section 14 of A Flurry in Diamonds by Amos Chiptree. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. Chapter 17. We all, save Sloane, jumped to our feet and stood in startled surprise. Mr. Lindley stopped as suddenly as if he had been shot, and altogether there must have been presented for Sloane's admiration as interesting a tableau as it had been his lot to witness for many a day. The silence for a few moments was intense. No one either moved or spoke for the space of a minute, as it seemed to me, when, slowly moving through the doorway, Pierre stepped into the room, his eyes moving from one to another of us, with an expression in his face of mixed wonder and curiosity which I shall probably never forget. The situation seeming to strike Miss Hartwell as something ludicrous, she was the first to break the silence. When we get our wits after this sudden interruption, perhaps we may resume our politeness and— Excuse me, Grace, broke in Mr. Lindley, turning towards us. I know what you would say, but I claim the right to settle this matter in my own way. Turning again to Pierre, as there are some explanations required of you, sir, before you can resume your position and standing in this house, you will oblige me by leaving this room with me and— in a more retired place, explaining your peculiar actions of the past week. Pierre stood with his eyes riveted upon his father's face, deeply interested in his words. As Mr. Lindley concluded, Pierre, with an uneasy, inquisitive sort of look towards the ladies and myself, and a rapid glance at Sloane, who still remained seated, responded, Well, father, I must confess that this is a rather peculiar kind of reception for one to get at home after a week's knocking about the country i am completely in the dark as to what it all means and my curiosity being considerably excited i desire to get at the bottom of it as soon as possible i am ready sir they had no sooner left the room than relieved of the strain of our late embarrassing situation and recovering our senses we began exchanging views as to the upshot of the affair we should soon know the result so that any further conjectures would not be in place yet we all agreed that so far pierre in word and action had indicated that our confidence in him had not been misplaced we had not long to wait yet to us in our suspense the minutes seemed drawn out into hours presently they returned mr lindley with his arm locked into pierre's and the faces of both covered with smiles advancing towards us as they reached the middle of the room they halted and mr lindley spoke as follows a great load has been lifted from my heart to-night one that i did wrong in ever permitting to rest there at all i need only say further that the first part of your prophecy fred has been fulfilled to the letter and that it only remains for me to keep my promise to you to render it complete i have already obtained pierre's forgiveness of my sin towards him and i turn him over to you for your congratulations as i freely acknowledge the cruelty and wickedness as grace would call it of my mistaken suspicions against him when you get through with him i fancy from some things which came out in our interview that he may have a story to tell which will have some interest to all here including our friend mr sloan if pierre had thought his former reception peculiar he must have considered it fully compensated for in the warmth of the welcome which then met him kate was exuberant in her joy alternating in tears and smiles as she hugged and kissed him miss hartwell though not demonstrative in manner showed much feeling in congratulating him upon his return for myself i told him that though i was not at all surprised at the happy ending to the comedy at the same time i was glad more on behalf of the others than on my own account that he had relieved us of further suspense when we introduced sloane to him he received him most cordially and insisted upon his remaining to hear his account of some incidents of the case which might interest him. We were soon all seated and eagerly awaiting for him to commence his story. Looking around our little circle, his countenance showing a self-complacent, amused sort of look, he began, In the first place, Fred, I suppose your diamonds should be accounted for so far as my knowledge of them goes. I am greatly surprised at hearing from father that you know nothing of their whereabouts it is very strange but perhaps after hearing what i have to say about them you may be better able to account for their second disappearance than i am as he proceeded he had assumed a serious look not at all feigned 
What can he mean, I thought, completely taken aback by his words. Certainly, so far, he was not very reassuring to our hopes with regards to the missing jewels. Noticing my inquiring look, which was reflected in the faces of the others, excepting Mr. Lindley, he continued. To go back to the beginning of this curious affair, last Tuesday morning, on my way down to breakfast, as I was starting down the upper stairway, I saw a father coming from his rooms. When he was passing the door leading into Kate's front room, he suddenly stopped, apparently startled by something which he saw within the room. Hesitating only a moment, he stepped inside the door, and I, considerably interested in his strange movements, quietly moved down a few steps until I had a clear view of the room. What followed then you all know, how he removed the diamonds and carried them through into his own room and locked them in his drawer after having discovered Winnie handling them. Winnie came hurrying out and up the stairs without seeing me until she had nearly run against me. Waiting a few moments for father to get through with the diamonds and go downstairs, I went cautiously down and into his room to carry out a little scheme which had occurred to me while watching his maneuvers. In the first place, I thought him overcautious and mistakenly suspicious of the girl, and in the next place was amused over his peculiar choice of a place for securing the diamonds. To convince him of the fact that he had not ensured their safety by merely placing them out of sight, I conceived the plan of removing them from the drawer and returning them to their proper owner. As I passed the safe in going into his room, I noticed that it stood wide open. This fact I saw would prove of advantage to me in carrying out my little joke. Why father had not availed himself of the safe in secreting the diamonds was incomprehensible to me, as I thought he must have noticed that it was open when he went past it on his way out the first time. As you are aware, I was not long in securing the jewels, after which I wrote the message to Kate upon the back of one of her photographs which I luckily found in the drawer. As I turned to go, the idea struck me that if I should raise the window over the back porch, it would add to the excitement when the diamonds were missed, and, acting upon the idea, I threw it open before going out. While I was fumbling about the drawer, I chanced to look into the mirror in front of me, when I saw the girl Winnie reflected therein as she stood in Kate's room, an interested observer of my movements, through the medium of the mirror there. I cannot say whether or not she caught my glance, if she did, she gave no evidence of it that I could see. I placed the card in the safe in such a position that I supposed it would be the first thing noticed when the safe door was opened. I locked the safe for two reasons. The first being that, as there was much valuable property in it, it was as well to have it secured. The other, and most important one to me just then, was that, when the diamonds were missed, search would naturally be made to discover if anything else were taken, and Kate, remembering the open safe, would hurry there, and, finding it locked, upon opening the door, would discover my message. I never imagined it to be possible that any but the correct interpretation of the message could occur to either you, father, or Kate, but, to make myself secure against your misapprehension of my meaning, I suggested your showing it to Fred, when he should call for the diamonds, as I fancied he would do on his way down to business. I had no doubt but that he would see through my plan. I wrote the message hastily, perhaps somewhat excitedly, too, and its meaning may have been somewhat obscure, but, if my plan had worked as I had anticipated, that would have been of little account, as you had plenty of time before I left town in the afternoon to have straightened matters out. It was an unfortunate omission that you made in neglecting to look in the safe at first, and how you, Mr. Sloan, should have overlooked it, I cannot easily comprehend. The conversation at the breakfast table was convincing to me that the plot which I had laid for a little scare to both father and Kate would prove successful. I saw nothing of how it was possible for it to miscarry, as it appears to have done, with such unfortunate accompaniments. Father, it appeared, had hidden the diamonds more in spirit of mischief and to have a little fun at Katie's expense than from any fear of their being stolen. Taking the cue from him, I coincided with him in his reproofs of Katie's carelessness, while I inwardly chuckled over the clever manner in which the tables would be turned against him by my little scheme. I went first to my office after leaving here, as I thought it a little early for you to be at your store. I soon became busily engaged in all thoughts of the diamonds and the joke connected with them slipped from my mind for the time. It must have been somewhere between ten and eleven o'clock, when, in searching my pocket for something, my hand came in contact with the box, and I was suddenly reminded of the diamonds. 
Seizing my hat, I went immediately around to your place. I learned that you had gone out, but that your father was in the office. As I had not much time to spare, I decided to leave the jewels with him and not wait for your return. Acting upon this decision, I walked into the office, explained matters to your father, and left the diamonds in his care. Here ends my knowledge of them, and, I think, also my responsibility for them. I was completely mystified by this statement of his disposition of the jewels, although I had anticipated, shortly after he began, what it would lead to. Were there any persons in the office with father while you were there? I asked. Yes, he replied. One or two gentlemen who were strangers to me, and who were about leaving as I entered. And, now I think of it, your traveling man, Watson, was sitting there reading a newspaper. We had a short conversation together before your father was disengaged with the other persons. Did Watson learn of your errand there? I asked eagerly, for I began to suspect something. Or see the earrings? Yes, to both questions, he replied. As your father was looking over the jewels, after I had told him how I came by them, he called Watson up to see them. Of course I took no receipt for them, merely stating that one pair of twelve submitted by you had been selected and retained, that you knew of this and which pair it was. I requested your father to count them and see that there were eleven pairs in the box, to which he laughingly assented, and pronounced them all right. You certainly should be able to account for their absence in some way, Fred, at least so it appears to me. There is only one explanation, I said, which I can think of, which promises anything like a probable solution to this new mystery, and in the absence of any other, I shall proceed upon that. It is that Watson added the whole lot of those earrings to his stock of jewelry, which had already been selected and packed. It is all right, of course, provided it is true, as I had intended to have him take them or part of them with him, but that father should have given them to him without having made any memorandum of the fact or mentioned it to me, is very strange, and not according to his usual careful business ways. True, in the excitements of that day, in my absence from the store until after he had left, he may have had no opportunity of speaking to me, but he certainly could not have omitted making some record of the affair and put it with the other papers which he left for me to attend to. It is strange indeed, but there is no doubt but that the diamonds are all right, Pierre, and will be properly accounted for. Watson will return tomorrow morning, and therefore I shall soon learn whether he knows anything about them. Father himself will not be back until the last of the week, but I know his present address and shall telegraph him for information, if I do not succeed in getting what I want from Watson. You can rest assured that, through one or the other of them, we shall learn all we want to know. But, proceed with your story, as we are impatient for an explanation of other matters fully as important as this of the diamonds. Resuming, Pierre said, Father has told me, Mr. Sloan, about the finding of the telegram in my desk and how you and Mr. Blakely, connecting it with the discovery of Walter Clark's absence from the city on business pertaining to the sale of certain lands, and with my endorsement of his note, formulated a theory which seemed to account for my sudden departure. You have my thanks for your charity towards me in this respect, when the case against me had so bad a look that Father himself could not be convinced of the plausibility of your reasoning. It was a very ingeniously constructed theory, sir, and, unlike many of such structures, it had the merit of being strictly correct and only needs a little filling in of details on my part. Clark had negotiated the sale of a large tract situated in the heart of the Adirondacks. The purchase was in the interest of parties who, in prospecting for a site for a hotel, had selected this tract as especially available for their uses. It was situated in a picturesque region high up among the hills, and enclosed a pretty little lake. It was at a considerable distance from the railways, and to reach it necessitated a long ride over pretty rough roads. These facts had, heretofore, tended to keep its attractions unknown to all but comparatively few of the visitors to those parts, but the growing popularity among our people of a summer life in these grand old woods has made a demand for such sites like this of Clark's, and they are rapidly advancing in value. He had obtained the promise of a good price for the land, the papers were being prepared, and he was expecting to soon consummate the deal when this hitch occurred through a flaw in the title being discovered in searching the records. As soon as he was notified of the trouble, he hurried up there to confer with the lawyers on the other side, hoping that he might be able to clear the matter up by himself without assistance from me. It was arranged before he started that, failing to accomplish his object promptly, 
he should telegraph me and i should join him at some designated point as soon as possible this was the situation of affairs when the message arrived last tuesday and in response to which i left town so suddenly some time previous to this however i had received the money on father's account and had placed it in the office safe expecting to bring it up to him when i came home that evening as i looked at my watch after receiving clark's message i found that i should have time enough on my way to the cars to stop at the bank and deposit the money i thought this the best plan i could follow with regard to it and did so without stopping to consider the fact that father would have no way of knowing what i had done mr blakely came into the office just as i was ready to leave and i forgot to mention anything to him about my receipt of and disposition of the money though i think i did request him to send word up here about my going away father tells me that he called at the bank next day upon other business and that while there he got his pass-book which he had left there some time before if he had examined that book carefully he would have found under the proper date an entry of the deposit to his credit as he can inform you he did so find it a few minutes ago when he consulted the bank book at my suggestion i met clark at the appointed time and place and together we set about it to remove the difficulties in the way of the transfer these difficulties of themselves were slight merely the result of carelessness on the part of someone connected with a former deal in the property in not getting the signatures of some distant heirs but it required considerable traveling here and there about the rough country before we succeeded in finding all the parties we managed finally to obtain all the desired signatures in some cases without much difficulty in others only after considerable argument and for cash considerations we closed up the matter late on saturday clark received his money and we started for home as soon as possible end of section fourteen section fifteen of a flurry in diamonds by amos chiptree this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tom penn chapter eighteen i have given pierre's story as nearly as i can remember it in his own words and without commenting upon the effect which certain parts of it produced upon different members of the party he was allowed to proceed without interruption although it was amusing to note his study of our faces at various important points of the story as he concluded he was again overwhelmed with the congratulations of all present and must have felt himself quite a hero in our estimation the reference to the missing money must have been quite surprising to sloane as it was the first intimation he had had concerning it conversation over the various incidents of the affair became most animated now that everything seemed so plain and clear i wonder said miss hartwell how you ever got into such a tangle over the affair in the first place now that we know the truth easily enough i replied as you will see when you recall our mistakes and omissions at important points of the investigation with regard to the diamonds the first and most disastrous blunder occurred as he admits himself when mr sloane omitted to see the safe opened in connection with the safe kate also must own to a little remissness in that she left the door open after removing the diamonds and afterwards failed to notice that someone besides herself must have closed it the circumstance of the card falling face up and thus hiding what was written upon its back was unfortunate but to the girl winnie must be attributed more than to any one else a cause for our being so misled in our suspicions i cannot understand why with her knowledge of pierre's actions she should have allowed herself to rest under suspicion for hours after she might have cleared both herself and her brother and at the same time have saved us much needless trouble and anxiety why fred said pierre laughing don't you see that winnie had too high a regard for me to renounce me to my own family as a thief preferring rather to allow herself to be suspected for a time thus giving me a chance to get beyond reach when matters began to look serious for her and that worthy brother of hers and after i had secured a good start she gave me away to kate but as she winnie had anticipated it was then too late to overhaul me i am sorry that she made so serious an error by her mistaken zeal in my behalf but must acknowledge my obligations to her for the friendliness of her motives do you think that winnie suspected you of really stealing the diamonds i asked rather surprised at his words i certainly do he answered what else do her actions indicate she evidently followed me down the stairs and watched me unobserved as she thought just as she would any thief then in her account of it to kate 
she showed that such was her idea and really i did not much wonder at it when i considered the circumstances and that she was not the only one to whom my actions gave the same impression with a sly glance at his father just here i have something to tell you which will be of news to all of you and rather startling news too i fancy it was fortunate for you fred that i took charge of your diamonds as otherwise they would probably have fallen into the hands of a less worthy person as i put it in my message to kate although when i wrote those words i had not yet learned what i now tell you before leaving the house that morning i went from the breakfast table to my room for something i had forgotten on the way i heard loud talking and wrangling in the direction of winnie's room and as i caught something about money and diamonds i became interested and secreting myself inside my room i listened i soon found that winnie was having some sort of a quarrel with her brother richard as she called him he seemed very angry and talked in a loud voice while his sister spoke in low cautious tones and was trying to quiet him i soon caught enough of their conversation to discover that richard had by some means learned of the presence in the house of an unusual number of diamonds and had come here to steal them he had either been caught by winnie while he was prowling around the house in search of them or else had come up there for the purpose of compelling her to assist him in the theft winnie seemed terrified at his words and was trying to induce him to leave by offering him money but although i fancy he took the money he did not seem disposed to go finally i heard her tell him that the diamonds were not in the house that they had been already stolen and that if he did not leave the house before the family came up from breakfast and discovered the loss he would get himself and her into trouble the fellow would not at first be convinced that she was telling the truth but when she repeated her statement and also added that she had witnessed the robbery although she did not name the thief and that there would soon be great excitement over the affair he appeared to consent to go in a moment they passed my door on their way downstairs i was surprised that he should accept her statement about her having seen the diamonds taken without further question but he was greatly excited and is probably not very sharp and consequently failed to notice the improbability of her having witnessed a robbery and instead of notifying the family of the fact waiting for them to discover the loss themselves i congratulated myself over the lucky escape of your diamonds fred and saw something besides a joke in my having taken them and in my allusion to both father and kate in the message at being improper custodians of them really in the light of what i then knew my message seemed almost prophetic we were all deeply interested in this statement by pierre but not more so than sloane who throughout its recital sat with his eyes steadily fixed upon him when he had concluded sloane addressing me said in a very self-satisfied manner this story furnishes another proof sir of the correctness of my suspicion that the girl in her statement did not tell all she knew no wonder that miss lindley found her excited before she told her of the supposed robbery considering the experience she had just passed through witnessing in what she believed to be the theft of the diamonds by young mr lindley followed so soon by the disgraceful actions of her brother i knew well enough at the time that if she would only tell us all she knew it would be of service to us i was misled by her into suspecting her of being in league with richard but it appears that i did not go far astray in my suspicions against him i could not be supposed to know that mr pierre had anticipated him in getting hold of the jewels thus interrupting his little game i own up to my mistake with regard to the girl and am sorry that she should by her reticence have aroused my suspicions against her i was not responsible for that when she learns of the results in this case she will see that her mistaken course has led to unnecessary trouble and confusion while it has not benefited either herself or her brother we appreciate your interest in the affair sloan i replied and are under many obligations to you although you were not successful in your first efforts here i can see now that if we had allowed you to proceed in your own way instead of retiring you when you supposed you were upon the point of success you would have gotten at the real facts of the case several days sooner than you finally did in what way fred eagerly asked kate if we had informed mr sloan i answered of winnie's story to you and of pierre's absence of course he would have proceeded at once to find a cause for the latter and would have settled it all in a day or two just as he did when we finally told him of those facts or even if we had not told him ourselves the imprisonment of richard and her own threatened arrest would have caused winnie to tell him of what she saw reflected in the mirror and the result would have been the same 
I see it, Fred, said Mr. Lindley, and that the discharge of Mr. Sloan was another blunder on my part. I am afraid, sir, I replied, that if we continue looking for blunders, as you call them, we shall find that none of us are exempt from their commission, excepting only Pierre. Therefore, I propose that we cease speculating over the what-might-have-beens of the past, and congratulate each other and ourselves upon the present happy termination to our perplexities. Nothing remains to entirely clear us of further doubt, but a confirmation of my belief as to my father's disposition of the diamonds, which, I am confident, I shall have early tomorrow. If I am right in this supposition, I shall also be able to prove Miss Hartwell to be the legitimate owner of a choice pair of the missing brilliants. While all, excepting Pierre and Sloan, knew something of the drift of my latter remark, they all seemed equally astonished at it. After Miss Hartwell had explained in a droll manner to Pierre and Sloan the temporary excitement which a fancied resemblance between the solitaire earrings which she was then wearing and some of my missing ones had created, she turned to me and asked in what way I expected to prove the identity of the jewels. Very simply, I replied. Our man Watson evidently sold some of the earrings soon after his arrival in Boston to Messrs. Blank and Co., and you became a ready purchaser of a pair of them, all of which goes to show the fine artistic taste possessed by yourself and the gentleman in question. I thought I could not easily be deceived in our own work, but the facts connected with your purchase of them compelled me, at that time, to abandon any hope of obtaining from them a clue worth following just now those very facts are strong evidences to me that mr watson will to-morrow confirm what i have predicted chapter nineteen it turned out just as i supposed next morning on reaching the store i found watson already there father had given him all the earrings returned by pierre he had sold several pairs of them to blank and co on the day after he had left the store and a reference to his memorandum book showed that the pair purchased by miss hartwell was among those thus sold among the letters in the morning mail upon my desk was one from father enclosing a memorandum of diamond earrings returned to store by mr pierre lindley which i gave to mr watson to add to his stock for boston trip here followed a list of numbers and marks taken from eleven pairs of earrings which upon comparison tallied with my private memorandum of those which i took with me to mr lindley's house including the pair selected by kate they were all accounted for father in his letter explained the enclosure by saying that in looking for a certain paper in his pocket-book he had found this instead and could only account for its presence there and the absence of the other paper by supposing that he had mistaken one for the other at the office the private paper to which he referred contained the names of some hotels and other information of value to tourists which he had jotted down at the suggestion of a friend who had called at the office and who was experienced in the section which father proposed visiting in his haste at leaving he probably placed the wrong paper in his pocket-book in which case i had probably found the other among the papers and letters which he had left for my attention it was of no value then and i might destroy it if i had not already done so i remembered some pencil notes such as he mentioned which i had found among other papers upon my desk as they did not interest me in any way i did not understand why they had been placed there and had returned the paper to my father's desk for him to dispose of upon his return it still remained there and an examination of it showed it to be the paper for which he was searching when he came across the memorandum of the earrings the two papers were exactly alike in size and shape and might easily be mistaken for each other by a person in haste such errors frequently occur but are seldom followed i fancy by results as serious as followed this oversight of father's his letter cleared up the only remaining mystery connected with the diamonds and nicely rounded up the explanations previously made by pierre what at one time had looked to be so serious an affair had now that the light was turned upon it from all directions proven to be but a singular mixture of incidents which harmless of themselves by their peculiar combination had been the cause of much anxiety perplexity and trouble now that it had terminated so happily we might laugh over our experiences, but, all the same, would not wish soon to repeat them. Chapter 20 As soon as she learned of Pierre's return and of his explanations which followed it, Winnie made a clean breast to Kate of her rencontre with her brother, as overheard by Pierre. It had greatly alarmed her, and she had since been in constant fear that, when matters had quieted down again in the house, Richard might repeat his visit kate consulted with her father and pierre on the subject and as a result of their conference pierre visited richard at his home 
told him what he had overheard, and promised him clemency if he would agree to leave the city and remain away. Richard accepted the alternative, and, provided by Pierre with a passage ticket and enough money to furnish him support until he could secure employment, he left for a far distant western town. I leave him there in the hope that, separated from his old companions and the temptations of city life, and dependent upon his own energies, he may redeem himself from his bad character and habits and start upon a career of honesty and industry. As it may be expected of me to give some further information upon a more interesting part of my story, I will say that I have an engagement to appear in Boston shortly as best man to Pierre at his marriage with Grace Hartwell, to whom Kate is to be first bridesmaid. I am still a frequent visitor at the Lindley's, more so than usual just at present, as the arrangement of details of the approaching wedding appears to require many conferences between us. I have tried to comfort myself in my bachelorhood with the thought that Kate, feeling the loss of her brother's society, might possibly allow me to take his place in her sisterly affection. I mentioned the subject to Pierre the other day, and his answer was such a peculiar one that I have been puzzling over it ever since to try and get at what he meant. Said he, Kate don't want any other brother, and if she did, you ought to see that you could not properly assume the role. That is not what is ailing you, my boy. Your symptoms indicate something more serious. Kate is also, I think, suffering from some cause. Grace and I had similar premonitory symptoms, and I suggest that you and Kate get together and compare notes, as we did. It will be comforting, at least, and may, as it did in our case, result in your discovering a remedy. Try it, my boy. It can't hurt you in any event, and I really believe it will help you out of your trouble. I shall have to ask Kate what he can mean. The End End of Section 15 End of A Flurry in Diamonds by Amos Chiptree